This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. To the highway, in a brand new day, gotta let it go. So far, platforms and applications and you can follow us on twitter at open voice box i am one of your hosts Doesn't it feel like it's been a long time since we've done a podcast? I've had such a long last. Yeah, I was only it was only eight days ago. You know, normally we record Tuesday nights this week. We had to do Wednesday because I, I wish I, I was telling uh, my my girlfriend about this. I wish you would have asked me this on the air last week. As soon as we got done recording, Mike goes, so we're not doing a podcast next Tuesday, right? Like you seem like you have Valentine's Day plans. I was like, that is indeed correct. Uh, we will not be talking about Drangate on Valentine's Day. I will be doing something else with my time. But it's it, it feels like I haven't talked to you in like a month. The last eight days, I mean, I have gone and have embodied my best uh, Western wear self. Oh, uh, no. Oh, boy. What happened? I have an addiction. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> My addiction is production equipment. Because since I've moved here, I've been trying to get everything to sound right. And everything work wise so you to get kind of sussed out correctly and i find myself like i packed my production box i packed a pelican to come down here and I keep on finding myself if not daily every other day going crap i really wish i had a cough button right now things like that and i i can't help myself i it, it's, i just can't it's one of those deals if you've never played with you know this world it's really hard to stop once you start. And I I went a little bit crazy two years ago getting the setup that I have now, but I, I can't do anything else because it's never just one purchase. Once, once you realize you need something, you're going to realize you need something else, and it's an endless cycle. I mean, I, I work in this field for a living. Like, audio production is technically what I do, and I have zero engineering skills whatsoever – so luckily that prevents me from a lot of purchases. And then my, my real job takes so much time out of my day that I, you know, I have grandiose ideas for what wrestling uh, production and analysis could look like. I don't have One the day. hours in the day. And I don't day. have the hours in the day to do it. Exactly. So it, you're, uh, you know, the, the Spears Ovation platform that you have going on, there's a lot of stuff that I like that you do there that again, if I had more time and if I was less tired, I think you and I could do some really cool things together, but I have a job that eats up half of my day and I, I get about six or seven hours of sleep. And then we're left with about two to three hours every day during the week where I can do something. And, and 
more often than not that is going to be watching wrestling or watching basketball. But it, it's look, it's yes, it, you're absolutely right. It's an addiction. I don't suffer from it necessarily, but I am very much aware of what you're going through, the mental place that you have to be in when you log on to Sweetwater.com and you go, I get oh, this, buddy. this and this and this. And, uh, and then before you know it, you've spent $500. Case, I have a account manager at Sweetwater. It's that bad. Be- best customer service on anything ever. I mean, I bought my audio interface two years ago and I got a call from them like a year after I bought it, like 18 months, maybe at seven in the morning. And they go, Hey man, just check in and just want to make sure everything is good. I was like, yeah. Have you heard something like, no, you're still you know, valued customer. Just want to make sure everything's good. And, and, and it was, I mean, they will be at my funeral making sure that my funeral is mic'd properly and to see if there's anything they can get me from beyond the grave. Yeah. And it's for me, like doing the spears evasion stuff is one thing. And it's a trying to get myself to something that like I by nature and by job, I take on a lot of various production jobs like it. A lot of it's archiving, some of it's editing. So, so I like being able to be a Swiss Army knife like it, it is something where it's like when I get this cough button, should I think about updating my grip bag? I haven't gripped for like three years case, but I feel like the need to like make sure my grip bag is ready to go at any time. If someone says, hey, Mike, can you run lights on my production or on my movie? Yes, I want to be able to say that, but the Spears, Low, Krach, uh production, wrestling production. Uh, oh I, God! I, guess I mean, company. that's that's literally the dream. I mean, I you know, uh, what what I lack in technical skill, I think I offer in creativity, and I and you and Rich are both excellent at executing production skills. I mean, that's a real that's a real thing that we've thought about before. We talked about that when Flow Slam was a thing of <laughs> d- d- can Gabe just fly us to Ebor City? Like we can we can help him. The three of us have the skills and again, I might not be up there lighting lights, but I've got a clipboard and I can make sure stuff gets done. Like that was a real conversation we had at one point. Case, I can get you competent at gripping within 45 minutes. Like you y- y- you'd be able to do this, but imagine the Fern Garden, I mean, excellent venue, top five wrestling venue. I, I've heard it being described, too, as the Tampa Kobe Chicken George, to be exact. I've, but, I've heard this. People people are saying that exact thing. They understand both of those references. Yes, exactly. But imagine that with the Spears low craze touch. Oh. Ooh, baby. Ooh, baby. Did you see WrestleCon is doing well, – here's the thing. Uh, production meeting on the air. We have yep. a Dragon Gate show to talk about. Not a ton happened on that Dragon Gate show. We're going to be talking about a lot of different wrestling on this show. Did you see that WrestleCon is doing Ultimo Dragon versus Nero Casas this year? Yes, it is the most. Uh, how should I put that? Uh, I know that they have that best match bounty. This they're not going for that. These two guys will <laughs> not go for the best match bounty. <laughs> I, my brother called out exactly what's going to happen. Shout out to Drew. It's going to be the the, the Hio Del Santo special, right? Which is what? Basically, they were forced into this uh, while also doing a meet and greet? Oh, well, well, that, but also it's going to go to a no, no contest when someone interferes and it turns into a tag match because oh. neither of these guys will take a fall. That's, God, you're exactly right. So it's going to be Sam Adonis and who interfering? Oh, gosh. I'm trying to think who... I'm trying to think who is a part of that group. I, I, I have not seen DMT Azul announced yet, so maybe Puma King in that. I, I have to be honest. I haven't kept up with the various stable movements in AAA as of late. I, Cubs, Cubs will, will correct us on this, but Sam and Donis will definitely be involved in doing this there, and then someone will probably get eat a La Maestra or La Casita. Yeah, I'm sure Cubs is chomping at the bit to uh, correct us on AAA booking. I, I will say... <laughs> You know, I went to that Galley Lucha show in Chicago. It was a year ago. It was last February and Ultimo was there. And I don't know what the rep Sam Adonis has as a worker because I, I, I don't particularly enjoy AAA unless it's something really, really hyped. I just I, – I, the I, – I don't like the promotion. It's just as simple as that. I You know, I've not always been the biggest Lucha guy, but I'm really into current CMLL and – I, I don't know. There's something about AAA that just doesn't do it for me. But I watched Sam Adonis in person last year, 
and I thought he was a lot of fun. Like I, I enjoy his shtick. I think he's he he's good at doing what he's there to do. I don't know if that's an unpopular opinion or not. You know what? You should watch if you have enjoyed it. He had his apuesta against Necrocasas, like in yeah. 20... Not, I have not seen that. That, that that's a little bit of homework for you. It was like the first show of the year in twenty nineteen or twenty eighteen, I believe, because twenty eighteen was Lucha Libre for Mike Spears. So that's right. I, I I would say that you'd probably really enjoy that. You know, I was just looking at a match card from 2020 to talk about uh, Kyoto attendances, and I was reminded of, you know, 2018 was Lucha Mike Spears. 2020, before the pandemic, was Mike Spears promoting Gamma as Worker of the Year, and I ran across that Ben K and Yamato versus Gamma and Masaki Mochizuki match and was just reminded of how sickeningly good that was. He had a stretch up until basically Champion Gate of like consistently having at least three and a half star matches each time he appeared. It wasn't a lot because it was Gamma working his schedule that he works, but each time it was like because that match rolled that I think I went four and a quarter on that match. Yeah, he had a few because it was obviously I mean, teaming with Mochizuki certainly helps, but that was like a thing that started off kind of as you and I joking about it. And then there were just a few gamma matches where we were like, wait, that was really good. There's a singles match he had with Yoshioka that I'm, I'm assuming was fine. And then everything after that is the pandemic, but that was a lot of fun. That was a good time. Yeah. Imagine the run gamma could have had if we didn't have COVID. What what COVID took away from us, Uh, you know, not, (laughs) not a, not a cheering crowd for the unit disbands match, but rather what gamma could have done. By the way, because this works so often on the podcast where I throw out a a question of, hey, if anybody has this match or this show, please send it to me. If anybody has gotten their hands on the Gamma Retirement Show, my DMs are open. I really wanted to watch that, and I think it was one of those deals where it was only released on DVD in Japan, and thus I I don't know if anybody's been able to track it down, and I don't know if it's out there digitally anywhere, but if you have that, please... Let me know. I I would really like to see. There's a what? Oh, what's the match on that show? Because it's like the Dragon Gate Rejects versus Strong Hearts. Let me pull that up real quick, just because I think people that listen to the show will recognize why I want to see this. Because obviously Gamma was there, and it was him and Shima versus Cosma and Magnitude Kishiwada in his retirement match. But the opening match is the Strong Hearts of Lineman, uh, Otsuka and T Hawk versus Naoki Tanazaki, Oji Shiba, and Super Shisa. And I really would like to see what that looked like. Yeah, I, I really want to see Shisa just give it to Otsuka. I mean, just the way that that kid deserves, you know? Yes. Yeah, completely. You know, another, I just as we kind of bounce Meander. around b- bounce around Japan here to prolong talking about this Kyoto show, which wasn't even a bad show. It was just, uh, you know, we came off of a Cork and Hall show where we had two hours of content that was practically written for us. This Kyoto show, we didn't exactly have all of that oomph to it. We didn't have that depth. I just watched the latest Gleet show. I'm a little behind on Gleet. Hadn't watched anything since the big Ishida versus Lindemann match in January. I watched Shigehiro Irie versus Yutani in a singles match at Shinjuku Face. Good match good match if you're into yutani go check that out that was a lot of fun yeah i find myself more into yutani than irie in that match to be quite honest in 2023 yes absolutely but they're they're uh kindred spirits in a way two guys that have for better or worse you know especially in the case of irie have gone about their careers in a very unique way and I, I like seeing them in that match. Good chemistry, hot crowd. I, I'm going to watch the rest of that show just because I thought Shinjuku face was so hot. And I'm kind of curious to see how they react to like Shima T-Hawk and Lindemann as a trio. That was not the show that Glendo Damal was on. Glendo Damal was the Gorilla Hall show, right? Well, he's, I don't, I don't think the Gorilla Hall show has happened yet, but he's on this tour. So, so this, Mike, this is right up your alley. Semi-main event. This is Gleet 44. Oh, today, yeah. February 15th, Kaz Hayashi, Minoru Tanaka versus Galino Del Mall and Kazuma Sakamoto. What's there not to love? Shimaism <laughs> lives today. It, it, it draws terribly, but Shimaism lives. Like That is one of those deals. Galino Del Mall, who I, I had seen a little bit in Big Lucha, and then I'm obviously about to watch him 
extensively in Glee. Talk about a guy who is 15 years too late. If Shima could have had him in 2006 Dragon Gate, I think he would have been a Dreamgate champion. He might have replaced Magdu Kishiwada. That's exactly it. I, I yeah. think... <laughs> not he's certainly not better than magnitude kishiwata but i think he just checks a few shima boxes where i if it was a different time in a different place i just think he would be crazy about this guy yeah it's just that there's something ab about like him coming out there and like the gift that was going around and everyone's just going like oh he's big and yeah it's he's, just he's really big <laughs> and it's something that's like, all right, as much as I love my man, man, check, it's not like he's putting the bulk in the bulk orchestra. Now you've got the bulk here. Yeah, very much so. Uh, one other one other general Japanese wrestling note before we talk about Dragon Gate. Did you watch Shingo versus Okada yet? Ooh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> you did? Sh yeah, Shingo. One that he's really making me reassess my top five Shingo. You, you really you you come away from a big Shingo match at this point in his career, and you go, God, he he's I mean he might be the best wrestler I've ever seen, and it it has happened a few times. I specifically think his chemistry with Okada, and this is their first non-pandemic match they've had with one another. Tanahashi's number one indisputable, Omega's number two. I, I think the gap, I'll say this, the gap between Omega and Shingo as all-time Okada opponents is closer than the gap between Tanahashi and Omega. Does that make sense? Oh, and that gap's getting closer each match. It, it is. I mean, I still think their first match, that it was that Autumn G1, I think the match was 10-10-20, because I remember liking the way it looked in my spreadsheet, the first Shingo versus Okada match would make my, this is a cursed playlist, but my pandemic playlist, because I just, I thought that match was so special. That was one of those where you go, oh my God, Shingo's doing it. Like, he's one of the guys. And then sure enough, over the next two years, he proved that he was one of the guys. And then to have it here, you know, in Osaka, hot crowd and everything, it, it was really nice to see. And it's, you know, other than Omega Osprey, my match of the year at this point, it's uh, number two. And it's something that I forget if we've talked about this on air case, but we are in the wrong universe because do you know what that class of 2004 could have been? Like what, what that should have lined up as. And in, ter Torimon. in terms of greater success for like Torimon. Well, what the, uh, I, I forget what class number this is, or this would have been, but the Trueborn class. If, in another reality, we could be talking about the greatest wrestling class of all time by, by just, like, acclamation. Because you would have had Shingo Takagi, you would have had BB Hulk, you would have had Akira Tozawa, and then things break differently. Kazuchiko Okada's in that class. Yeah. Things break differently again or someone actually isn't an absolute space cadet kota bushi's in that class yeah we talked about this privately last week for anybody that doesn't know can you speculate on the ibushi toriyamon history so abushi got rejected from toriyamon apocryphally like the, the story has always been there's been two things that got him rejected he wanted to apply to toriyamon and it would have been around 02 to 04, which is why I said, like, imagine this class, because 04 was Shingo, Hulk, and Tozawa. The thing is that he sent the application to the wrong address, eventually it got to Toriumon, and he did not include a, a photograph headshots to his resume. And that's something that's really big in Japan. Like, you include photos of yourself when you apply for jobs. So they just rejected it out of hand. Yeah, that's a, that's a big what could have been. And obviously in the limited interactions Ibushi has had with Dragon Gate since, whether it be the DDG shows or the, the times he popped up in 2007. Look, Cody Ibushi could have fit in in Dragon Gate quite handsomely. That, that would have been very good for both parties, but alas, you know, now, uh, now we await a triangle-shaped wrestling ring. Yeah, that wrestling school. Uh, yeah, I've got 
I, I, I need to like talk to some folks, but because I got some thoughts that I need to kind of run through with some people before I let them publicly know because I don't know about that. I'll leave it at that. I don't know about that case. I think the betting odds favor for what Japanese promotion Ibushi wrestles in next should be New Japan. I just, I, I, I because he's against working DDT, I don't see him showing up in Noah. And there's nowhere else for him to go. I mean, what's I don't I I, I say this in speculation, not in fact, but I, I can't imagine all Japan has the money to pay him unless it's for a one off here and there. It, it's not anything Dragon Gate needs. I mean, Kota Ibushi and Gleet would be awesome, but that seems unrealistic. I, I, I think he's going to tour the world again. And I think he's going to find himself back in New Japan. I think we're basically going to replay what was that 2017 that he disappeared right i yeah. think it's gonna be the same thing i i think that's the most likely result if not him plying his trade internationally just because like it there's a lot of reasons why kota bushi is kept at arm's length by some of these promotions and some of the promotions would be ones that he's already said he's not interested in working you know so New Japan, like just like old uh, wounds healing over time, is probably the most likely thing if you expect them to be working in Japan on a regular basis. I feel like, just in my opinion, though. You know, Rich and Joe had a very interesting discussion on this past week's flagship podcast, and I'm I'm straight up stealing their topic. Full credit to them. Great question that Rich asked. I I, I would like to hear this from you because you and I and Alan Forel obviously did the Greatest Wrestler Ever project in 2021. If you would like to hear the three of us discuss wrestlers from all across the world in all eras. Go to Alan's PW Torch shows. I, I highly recommend they're evergreen. Go back, listen to them. They're a lot of fun. But Rich asked the question, in real time, Mike, in your fandom, who are the wrestlers that you've watched where watching them makes you think this could be the greatest wrestler ever? Uh, wrestler ever? Uh, Masaki Mochizuki. Yep. Shingo Takagi. Yep. Kazuchika Okada. Okay. Uh, Brian Danielson. Is and that then, where the list ends? I mean, we're talking about watching live. Yep. That's the thing. After that, I mean, I've seen Tanahashi live, so I feel like that counts. I'm here. I'm. It's so interesting because you were so disconnected from New Japan for so long. I forget that you like Okada and Tanahashi, which isn't like a hot take by any means. You right, just yeah. when you unplugged from New Japan, you unplugged from New Japan. Yeah, it just was something that, like, as you said, like up top of the show, we only have so many hours in a day, and you know, I still check in uh, like uh, during like tournament times, and I keep abreast of like my favorite wrestlers there. But it's something that's for me. Before the pandemic, I was out, and it was just too much content, and I was just watching what I should cover. And also, when I when I unplugged, that was also when AEW and EE really was starting to build up, too. So it just was, like, the use of my time. So now I have more wrestling time, so I watch a little bit more New Japan, I guess. And a little bit of gleet here and there. So you said, so Mochizuki, Shingo, Okada, Tanahashi, Danielson. Eddie. 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 Watching Eddie. Yeah. Eddie, I forgot I've seen him live a couple times. Yeah, or I saw him live a couple times. Okay, I, I ask this because the, the name that they didn't mention on the podcast and the, the name that you didn't mention here, I, I echo Mochizuki, I echo Shingo, I echo Okada. I, I, Tanahashi is on that list of like the best guys that I don't consider to be the best ever. But when I watch Ibushi at his peak... And whether that's the two Nakamura matches, whether that's the Tanahashi G1 finals, whether that's the Ishii match from 2018, I, that's what why about, I... Go ahead. I was going to say, actually, I have seen Ibushi live, the four-way, the Chara well, not, four-way. Not, not, not even just live in person, but just in real time, guys, you've watched. Fair. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Continue. No, I just... I, it's It's why... You know, we we ranked 100 wrestlers. We probably considered 200, you know, each of us individually. The one that I always have the hardest time with is Kota Ibushi because there are times where I watch him and I go, I 
I don't think anybody else is on his level historically. I mean, the, he he gets to a point where he is everything that I desire a pro wrestler to be, and he's he's incredibly frustrating, which is unfortunate because I think if we just had, I mean, look, if he's just a New Japan Young Lion and he goes through that system and is not messing around in DDT all those years, yes, I think he loses a little bit of his charm. But I also think we probably get a greater consistency body of work from 2009 through about 2014. Not that there wasn't good stuff there. I just think we would get more of it. I really struggle with him because there are times and I and I have him as I as I look at my spreadsheet here. Historically, I have him ranked 28th. And that was what I did in 2021. I don't think that would change too much because he he really hasn't wrestled all that much since we did those podcasts. But he is a guy where I go on some days he's 28th and on some days he's eighth. And I, I just, he's so interesting to me. I hope for the sake of my entertainment, he lands somewhere that isn't game changer so that I, I can enjoy watching him again. Yeah. I guess the one thing that you brought up that I, not that I push back. I just wonder, do you think if he goes through the young line system, they kind of, grind down like the the sharp edges that kind of make him Kota Ibushi I, I think he has to be a different person to succeed in that young lion system right, yeah I, you know it's 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 a nice thought but it's it removes ego and personality and variables that simply just exist in the modern world I, I don't see that being a realistic thing in the same way there are you know there are some people that are cut out for the U.S. Army there are some people that are not it's not going to change largely. And it's the same deal with Ibushi. He's not meant for the new Japan young lion system. You know, he, he ultimately found the path that I think has led him to be the most successful, even though it's been frustrating along the way. My favorite teacher I've had in my life was a religious studies professor, a former Baptist preacher who had like a crisis of faith and politics and just became an absolute hippie. He, he had this analogy that I think works perfectly for Kota Ibushi, how you're describing him right here, Case. Okay. Some people are indoor cats. Some people are outdoor cats. Kota Ibushi might be the biggest outdoor cat possible. Very much so. A man you cannot tame. Exactly. He cannot be domesticated. The, the whole thing that cats start eating you if you die and they can't be fed, that clock is, is much shorter with Kota Ibushi than it is for a normal cat. Very much so. After a half after a half hour of banter, Mike, are you ready to talk about Dragon Gate? Yeah, uh, actually, case there's something Dragon Gate related I want to hit you with real quick before Fantastic. we get into. Fantastic. <laughs> That's no. Keep going, brother. What's up? All right. So, uh, as of six fifty six Central Standard Time. That's right. I'm back in God's time zone. I love it, case. Uh, Big Boss Shimizu posted a peach mango <laughs> bang. You know what's funny? I almost brought this up at the start of the show, and I didn't. And I'm glad you're this. You know, you do a podcast with somebody for long enough, and you become one mind. Yeah. And he says he he took a walk to a nearby supermarket, bought it here. It took about 40 minutes, uh, some ways. And the one response to him so far. So, um, uh, Big Boss Shimizu, uh, peach mango bang. Not a bad flavor, Case. I know that that's a little bit more high octane than energy drinks and caffeine you take most times. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's rocket fuel. And then the only post after it is La Estrella posting the uh, bang that he's having. And it's, Case, one of the most disgusting flavors of bang. Whole lot of chocolata. Yeah, that's, that sounds like electric chocolate milk. Like if you put a bug zapper in chocolate milk, I imagine that's just horrible. Yeah, no, it's it's by consensus the worst flavor of Bang. Should we talk about Kyoto finally? We should, because I, I don't have any confirmed scoops coming out of Austin yet, but stay tuned. I might have some next week. Oh, okay. So one show on the network this week, K Kyoto KBS Hall. Uh, it was on the 11th. It'll be up on the network until the 18th. As we've kind of been alluding to, it's not a bad show. It just is a show that happened. Yeah, very much so. You know, I, I I flirted with going... I mean, here's the thing. It's a six-match show, and I flirted with going notebook on three matches, one of which I ended up going notebook on. It's it's not a bad show by any means. It's just it, it didn't have the depth of that Cork and Hall show, like I said earlier. I should note before we break it down, total attendance, 349 fans. 
that is up from January, which was 326, and December, which was 322. If you want to go back to the two shows they did before the pandemic hit, just to give you an idea of what they were once doing in this building, January 11th, 2020, they did 630 fans, and February 16th, 2020, 586. So still a ways to go in terms of getting back to the numbers they once were at, but up as they should have been from December and January. Something that it did never escape that three and three quarters kind of like plateau for me. And it's not that I think that Kyoto is a bad town. It's just something that when I look at these matches, I'm just a little underwhelmed at what happened. And maybe that's my own personal expectations, I guess. Well, you know, ultimately these are probably the lowest level of the Dragon Gate shows that make the network. You know, Osaka's more important, Kobe's more important. Fukuoka at one time was certainly more important when there was Sakata Star Lanes. I mean, this is uh, the bottom of the barrel in terms of network shows. So it makes sense that we come away from these shows feeling this way. I like, you know, like in January, they do a, a, a double shot weekend in Kyoto and Osaka. Those weekends are a little bit more exciting than just a single shot in Kyoto. So the opener was Gold Class versus Zebrats. This was the complete uh, Gold Class unit. Kota Minor, BB Hulk, and uh, Binke and Minorita versus Shun Skywalker, Diamante, Hyo, and Ishin. It was Hyo winning with a inside cradle after a box attack in case. This was really the Minorita show, wasn't it? Absolutely. I, I mean, there's specifically a comeback they made in this match where Shun Skywalker hits the monkey flip on Binke. And he, he sends Ben into Hulk and Minor. And we've obviously seen Shun do this against Jason Lee and Jackie Funky Command, some of the smaller guys in the roster. He takes out the heavyweights of gold class like a bowling ball with bowling pins. And then all of a sudden the ring clears and it's just Minorita left. And Minorita makes this comeback that shows just how great of a wrestler he is. Again, we hit on this about four or five months ago where I started telling people, hey, check in on this guy. Pay attention. He's a guy and he's incredibly good for being a year into his career. And now he's, he's great. I mean, he is just objectively great and he has a comeback in this match that feels otherworldly. I mean, it, it feels like the type of thing that we would celebrate, you know, a Claudio for or a Ray junior type for, you know, some of these dynamic baby faces that we've seen throughout the 21st century. This Minorita comeback sounds dramatic to say because it was an opening match in Kyoto, but it was on the level of that sort of deal. And then the hot tag to Benke to end that Completely. sequence. Yeah. Just phenomenal stuff. It was the absolute highlight of it. I thought the finish was a bit messy. It, it, it was something that kind of actually took this from, from probably veering close to four stars to three and a half for me. It just was not... It, it's something I feel like the last few weeks that the finishes have not been as... Uh, as precise maybe or as deliberate as they have been in the past it seems like there's like a finish funk happening maybe i uh, i think it's just a thing called heat i i just think right now zebrats needs all the heat they can get and we're seeing that play out where at times it's satisfactory at times it isn't this was one of those times where it wasn't you know if this match ends with a Minorita flash pin after another 45, 60 seconds of action. I'm probably throwing this in the spreadsheet just because it's my style of wrestling. It wasn't that. We didn't get that. I end up going three and a half on this, but this match is on YouTube and it's well worth checking out. Absolutely. Especially for the uh, the, the, the section going into that Ben K hot tag with Minorita just hulking up. It was incredible. Uh, the next match we had was a singles match on the show. Kai versus Rhea Fuda. Kai won in three minutes and 14 seconds with a finger with a figure four after he completely dismantled this poor young man's knee. Oh boy. I, I don't know where you are on this, Mike, but this was one of the first times where I watched Rhea Fuda wrestle. I've been a vocal supporter of him, you know, obviously from his debut on, but even since the comeback, I've said this is... This is somebody that has a lot of talent. You know, don't give up on him. Keep on paying attention to him. I lost a little bit of faith in this match. It just, he came off like an absolute nothing. Like He, the, he didn't pop off the screen. Yeah, and maybe it was something that Kai 
Ty's role just completely dismantling him from the bell and taking out his knee, so it took out his offense. Maybe that's a story to be told but, about that, but it just wasn't it wasn't entertaining, and he's lost. It, it, it the, this is kind of the thing that got me about Fuda that it's just like he needs more, and it's just not there. You think about what Kai did with Nagano on his debut, and you think about what he's been able to do with Minorita at times, and it really, it's not a Kai issue. You know, Kai Kai is a great wrestler, and I, I say that, you know, if you would have played me this audio in January of 2019, I, I would not believe what I'm saying, but Kai is a great wrestler, and he's gotten a lot out of young Dragon Gate wrestlers. He's been a net positive for talent development, and this was one where I just thought Fuda looked so flat. And in a tournament, in a month where all of the talk, like, what are people in English talking about? They're talking about Kato and Nagano as a tag team. And on this same show, after getting left off of Cork and Hall, mind you, Fuda's on this show, and he just brings nothing to the table. Extremely disappointing performance. Yeah, and it's... It, it, it's something that I know you've been more patient than I have been about Fuda, but I just hope for his sake. I like seeing him in Dragon Gate. I think the way that he is as a striker is interesting and sets him apart, but it just doesn't seem like he is progressing anywhere close to a rate to instill any sort of confidence about his long-term future in the promotion, frankly. Here, here's what I'll say. Have you watched any of this Kazuma Sumi kid in DDT? No, I haven't. Okay, so he is a Drangit trainee who dropped out, joined DDT, debuted in October of last year. And DDT right now is doing the Degenerations Cup. So it's it's eight of their young guys. And the gimmick is that the winner is going to wrestle on the GCW versus DDT show and the GCW go, or in the DDT goes Hollywood show. Good gimmick. I, I was, you know, it's very similar to the rookie ranking tournament. Drangate did round Robin tournament, two blocks. The, I, I have not seen any of the B block, but I've watched the three matches that Sumi had uh, against Hideki Okatani, Yuya Koraku and illusion. Ryu Fuda would be the best wrestler if he was in the A block right now. There, There's no doubt about that. These young DDT kids have potential. You know, I really like this Koraku kid. And in Kazuma Sumi clearly has potential. I mean, it's very obvious that he has at least some foundational Dragon Gate training just from watching him wrestle. Fuda's better than all of these guys, but Fuda is really struggling now to keep his head above water. Again, I, I I keep on pointing to, well, you know, he did this and he's got this and look at him on the undercard. He was kind of fun here. I don't know. This Kai match took the wind out of my sails in a way for Fuda where now I'm, I'm gravely concerned for his future. Not that I, I think anything bad is going to happen to him. Not that I think he's going to get dumped from the promotion. I just want all of these guys to be stars for the sake of the promotion. And Fuda is just not trending in that direction whatsoever. And it's something that at what point you just kind of wonder, like, there, there's always places for ditch diggers in this. I mean, Hazy might potentially be the greatest lost post of all time in that stretch, but I just wonder because he was so snake bit with injuries, and you and I don't, I don't think anyone should hold injury records against someone when you talk about talent development, but he's almost. He, he's approaching his second anniversary. Like he's 18 months in at this point, like maybe not 18 months, 15 months in. And I don't know, maybe it's something that green near pastures might be better for him. Cause I don't think well, it's, it, be it's just here. look, it, it's, it's wrong place, wrong time. Uh, again, I, I always go back to this. If he was in Noah, people would be salivating over him. If he was in all Japan, people would be salivating over him. If he was in new Japan, he wouldn't be the top dog, but he would be respected. He would be the best wrestler in this DDT tournament. He is just coming into the promotion at a time where his direct contemporary is Takuma Fujiwara. His other contemporary is Minorita, and he has Mochizuki Jr., Yoshiki Kato and Kaito Nagano hot on his heels. And they, I mean, they surpassed is not the right word. They've lapped him and then the donuts in his front yard. I, I mean, it's just, it's completely absurd to think how young Kato is, you know, the three months of wrestling compared to the 15 months of Fuda and the difference that's there, both in terms of polish, but then also just 
the way they are presented and protected, it's a completely different ball game. That doesn't mean food is a bad wrestler. And, and Mike, might I remind you, and I have to tell myself this, it just takes one. You know, you go back to February of 2017, Takahiro Yamamura was trending upwards, but he wasn't breakout star worthy. You know, he wasn't open the Brave Gate champion within a few months. Okay. This was a guy who who was young and was a blue chip prospect, but wasn't putting it all together. And he and Big R Shimizu have that 20 minute draw on Cork and Hall changes the entire trajectory of his career. And if he hadn't gotten injured, you know, to just a, a, a horrid degree, we would still be able to point to that one single match as the match that changed not only his career, but changed his life. It just takes one with Fuda, but he's getting these little opportunities here and there. And I'm starting to worry that he's not making the most of them. Well, the the thing also about Yamamura was he was in a position where they said, go out there and have a 20 minute time limit draw. There's nothing even close to that in Fuda. No, I mean, you can't, you can't put him out there for that long. People would, would not be interested. Even if it's one of those deals where the crowd gets invested, the longer the match goes, the, the risk isn't worth the reward at this point in his career. And it's only shocking because, you know, other than a Sora Fujikawa or a Ricky Hashi, you know, guys that might have retired due to injury, it's been a very long time since we've had a wrestler debut in Dragon Gate and struggle to get out of the gates. You know, I always talk about the second chapter of a Dragon Gate wrestler's life, that's when we learn a lot about who they are because everybody starts off hot, but not everybody can can proceed once they get past that young boy stage of their career. That's where La Estrella has ended up. Is you know, Estrella debuted with a ton of hype, and he he's not always been perfect, but he was somebody that we saw potential in. And whatever this chapter two of his career has been is where he's really fallen by the wayside. Fuda's the the last guy I can remember. I mean, look at just the last decade of debuts. You know, T Hawk, Maria, Eita, Ut, Shimizu, Lindemann, Yamamura, Ashida, Ben, Shun, Hyo, Yoshioka. I mean, this is like he's not OG Shiba levels of unimportance, but that's probably the closest comp he has. I would argue that OG Shiba is more important because of his brother. Yeah, I just that's the thing, you know. If but but, but he's the comparison, if, right? It, it's him or OG. It's got to be. I mean, then you're Mike. You're at, at that point. You're looking at class of 2009 guys, just in terms of unspectacular rookies. Yeah. No, for sure. I'm rooting for him, but this was a three minute match against Kai that led to 15 minutes of discussion about how gravely concerned I am for his future. And I, and again, I you know it's it's not one of those deals. I don't see him being cut. That's not really the way Drangate operates. I could see him leaving out of frustration. And again, marginalized. If he does, marginalized. Yeah. It, yes. A very, very fair point. But again, you know, it's like, I, I don't want him to go anywhere, but I do wonder if he looks around and goes, well, you know, DDT is the land of misfit toys and I'm a misfit toy. And, you know, maybe with his striking background, Noah would be interested in taking a look at that again. If he debuts, in 2014, I think we're all a lot more patient with Fuda. He just happens to be surrounded by just a gross amount of young talent. I mean, prodigies. And the fact that he doesn't deliver to that degree makes him stick out like a sore thumb when you have, you know, on this show even, what what people are calling, you know, Match the Night and Kato and Nagano versus Jason and Jackie. It, it, I... I think he's a good wrestler. I think he has potential. He, just by the proxy of his environment, has been set up for failure, unfortunately. Yeah, no. And it's something that we can only hope that, you know, gets opportunities and is not. And I I don't even, I I feel almost a little bit disingenuous saying given opportunities because I can't even see that now, you know? Yeah, I mean, he he gets these singles matches, which not a lot of people do. He gets, you know, these match two singles matches, whether against Ata or Kai. You know, I, I think he had a, a few towards the tail end of 2022. 
that's where you just have to just explode with personality and charisma and do something memorable. Obviously, it's going to be easier for a guy like Kaito Nagano because he has that that high flying style that can leave an impression on you in a quicker amount of time. Fuda doesn't really have that, but it's not like it's not like it's impossible. You know, we've seen strikers have compelling sub five minute matches before. He has to be on that level. Yeah. And it's something that until uh, until he's able to do those in these matches, I don't see any reason to really forecast him out almost because it just seems like this is his lot in life at the moment. It's it, it's a bummer because, again, there's a lot of the talent there, but you're absolutely right. Yep. Uh, match three, we had the full complement of D-Courage. That is Yuki Oshioka. Dragon Daya and Madoka Kakuda versus the unaffiliated team of Eita, Ginki Horiguchi, and Takashi Yoshida. It was the hand of God on Ginki Horiguchi after a big butt bump out of the backslide from heaven. And, you know, this was a fun, like, this was the closest thing I would say to a touch football match on the show, but it just was more of like a greatest hits match. And it was fun. I I, I enjoyed it. I went three and a quarter. It was fine. Yeah, I mean, again, Ata's super over in Kyoto. I think that's worth noting, but it's fine. Do you think Takashi Yoshida is reusing gear now, and that's why he's bringing the masks back now? Uh, that that could very well be likely. Well, I don't remember what he was wearing in this match. He was mer- wearing full-on real hazard blue. Oh, that's that's right. Yeah, I look, I, I can't get in the head of Takashi Yoshida. I don't know what's going on there. I, I feel like doing so would drive you insane. So don't blame me with that. Uh, great, uh, great hand of God to finish the match. Ginky really ate that. I, I You know, Kakuta is just, he's on a roll. He is absolutely on a roll. You know, I was thinking earlier today, we don't have a clear direction for the Dreamgate match at Champion Gate, which I think is very odd. I'm very worried they're going to just throw Shun and Kakuta in there in Osaka. And I said this last week, I'll say this until we know what the Dead or Alive Dreamgate match is, if there is one. Kukuta versus Shun at Dead or Alive has to be the direction they go. I don't care what they do in Osaka. I'm not really worried about it. I just continue to hope that we get Kukuta versus Shun at Dead or Alive. Yeah, and it's something that you have such a quick turnaround with that cork and ending uh, Rey de Perejas that it'd be really kind of tough to derive something unless we get something come out of Fukuoka. So my eyebrows up at the very least. Uh, match four, this was the first Rey de Perejas match of the evening. This was the Kung Fu Master team of Jackie Funky Kame and Jason Lee entering the match with one point versus the rookie team of Yoshiki Kato and Kaito Nagano who entered the match on zero. And it was the rookies getting their first win of the tournament with a counter Jackie knife by Kato in 10 minutes flat. This was my match of the night. This was three and three quarters, and you can definitely make an argument for it being a notebook. Yeah, I think I'm the low man on this, and I still loved it, but it it wasn't my match of the night, even though I thought it was it was great. This is a match that I would go three and three quarters on. And I would urge everybody to go out of their way to watch it. When you look at the poise that Kato wrestles with having debuted in December and Nagano who debuted in August, just, just being there, you know, step for step with Jason and Jackie, two of the best junior heavyweights in the world, a marvelous performance from all four guys. And they did the smart thing of after Nagano's foibles, have Kato do the thing out of the Jackie knife, please. <laughs> that they, they, they took that away from there. But I think my favorite part of this match case was Jason Lee, the arm breaker, picking up from Corkin. I really enjoyed that little uh, nod backwards for that. And I, I, I think that Jason becoming the arm breaker is a great idea if they want to go in that direction. Look, time in the world we live in, time is just a black hole. I mean, it, it really... It seems to mean less and pass by and in quicker ways than it ever has before, just with the new cycles and the the amount of content we consume. But in Japan, in the context of Japanese wrestling with the pandemic, you know, a, a lot of time has gone by, and I think I'm still struggling uh, struggling to process all of it. But we're at a point now. You know, Jason Lee's been a wrestler on this roster for six years, and that because of all the changes that that kind of puts him in, you know, at least the top half of the roster 
in terms of longevity. Jackie Funky can make three years deep, but certainly more experienced than Nagano and Kato. And to see these guys over the last uh, two weeks, you know, with the Cork and Hall show and then with this, to see them dip into a side of work that we've never really seen from them, this elder statesman, grumpy, you know, I'm going to teach you a lesson type vibe, for them to be so good at it really in their first outing with it is so impressive. And it's, you know, I, I always say about Jason Lee, he's just, he's, he's the best junior heavyweight in the world. I, I think the world of him, he could go into any promotion and be the best wrestler on the roster. A, a really, really interesting match here. And and I have to credit Yoshiki Kato, you know, not the most polished wrestler. I will still say that. Yeah, that's his caveat. But Mike, does he not carry himself like a world champion? He does. In case I have to issue a retraction here. Yes, Pudge. I know I need to issue this retraction. Because he might be a great baby face. He might not be bad news. Everyone seems to love him. He's modeling stuff. He has a hell of a smile. Kato has really capitalized on everything. And I think he's actually kind of ironing out those foibles. I've really, I've been really impressed with Kato over the last four weeks. And he might still be someone who's never had a woken up on the right side of the bed, but Maybe he's a little bit more, uh, maybe he just has a little bit more flexibility in what he can be than we are anticipating, or at least on first looks. You know, it's so interesting. I'm glad you brought that up. The The discourse is kind of dominated right now, at least in our little bubble. And, and I don't want to speak for everybody, but the comments that I see is dominated by, okay, is Kato a heel or a face? What's he going to be? What's his future? And I, I really, at this point, have no direct thoughts on that. And it's not that I'm necessarily bored by the conversations that he's wrestled like 20 matches, and, and I don't know either. Am I a little surprised that he is as lovable, and not even likable, but lovable as he is? Yeah, absolutely, because he's the biggest guy on a roster full of small guys, and normally that that lends itself to being a great heel. But like you said, Kato is modeling clothing, he's getting these big reactions, he is certainly morphing into uh, a lovable monster type figure. And I think that's really interesting. I, I don't have predictions one way or another though, in terms of, you know, if you ask me at Kobe world, is he a heel or a face? I, I don't know. And I don't think Dragon Gate knows. I think they are riding this wave of momentum that they have with two young guys who they can put in big spots and they can trust. And, and I think they're celebrating that more than anything. Yeah, and it's something that it's way too early to, I think, say that. Like, he did come off in his rookie and first matches as that kind of character. But, I mean, showing this range only helps him out long term. Did you see his new, his first piece of merch case, his rally towel? I did. This man loves protein. How can't you love him? It, what, what's the exact verbiage? It says, what, Yoshiki Kato, I like protein? I love protein. I love, oh my God. Oh, 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 boy, oh, boy. If only, oh, what, what's the what's the uh, gym they used to work at? Thank mid-breath. you, thank you. Sorry. If Oh, if only mid-breath was around for Yoshiki Kato. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's something. I mean, back, it, I used to see all the time posted on of, from wrestlers in Japan B legend protein was always posted like whenever there's like, Hey, I just got workout or, Ooh, I just got this nice bag of protein. And I'm just thinking all the while I would love to see him like get a sponsorship deal. Like this is a guy that who knows with him. And that's what makes him excited. Like, I don't want to try to pitch and hole him. I don't want to say he's a face or heel. He is just fun to kind of figure out. It's going to be a fun ride to see where he gets to. Yeah. It's, it's funny. You know, I, it's not as prevalent as it was about a few months ago, but there was always always that conversation of MJF and, and whether fans cheer him too much to be a heel or whatever. It's like I, I don't I don't think it matters. I think he's going to present himself as a heel, and that's going to be the end of it. And the same way with Contra. Right now, he's wrestling like a babyface. He's going to be presented as such, and if he eventually gets booed, great. But right now, it would be it would be idiotic for them to have him wrestle like a heel because he's beloved by this audience. And if he's wrestling like a heel, you're burning the heel turn. Which there absolutely will be. There will be a heel turn just to turn him face later, and it'll be all worthwhile. Yeah, just hope that not, that the heel turn is not against Nagano. He might send him into lower Earth orbit. Oh, God, that'll be fun. That'll be really <laughs> fun. 
Absolutely. So, Case, next up was a special match. It was the Nosawa Wrong Guy Dragon Gate Final Special Six Man Tag Team Match. Ultimo Dragon, Dragon Kid, and friend of Dragon Gate, Nosawa Wrong Guy versus M3K, Susumu Mochizuki, Yazushi Kanda, and Mochizuki Jr. And this is how much of a friend uh, Nosawa is to the Dragon King Gate family. He gifted Ultimo Dragon the Law of Magistral in his last match. Or rather, Ultimo said, can I take this? And he said, yes, you can take this. <laughs> As Ultimo Law Magistral Mochizuki Jr. to end Nosawa's Dragon Gate career. Yeah, so I'm not interested in litigating any of the conversations we had in 2022. I said my piece on that, and now anytime I, I see Nozawa Drangate discussions, I kind of just roll my eyes. I'm I'm, I'm done with it. I, I said my piece and, you know, whatever. But I do still think sometimes when Nozawa pops up, people have irrational reactions to it. For some reason, he causes people at times to not think clearly. And Mike, just for the sake of history, because, you know, you might be the best person to ask about this. Can you sort of explain why Drangate felt the need to throw a retirement celebration for Nozawa? Yeah. So anyone like, again, like Hayes, like Nozawa gate, like we, we dealt with that. There's nothing we can add to that anymore. It's, it's tired at this point, but the thing about Nozawa, I would encourage people who wonder why we have always kind of been, had this approach about him, go pull up his cage match See how many times throughout the years he's popped up in Dragon Gate. It's a lot. It's pretty consistent, too. Even dating back a little bit to Torimon, not as much, but really after 2004, he pops up regularly. And that is because Nosawa and a lot of the people in Dragon Gate met Mexico, if not already knew each other from training. Of course, Nosawa was from Pro Wrestling Crusaders, a weird, a, a weird SWS offshoot that ended up later spawning DDT in a way. But they were, he was in Mexico along the same times as a lot of people from Toriamon. And he, uh, the, the way that it was described to me from someone who knows them and the situation, he was someone that at a time where, you know, it's tough as a student in a foreign lang foreign land, speaking a land language completely different of your own, and especially like saving up and do this. Sometimes it's really nice when you, you there's someone in your field who will take you out to dinner one night, you know, just like to do stuff like this. And people became friends with it. And ever since then, there's a reason why Nosawa always ends up in places. He is perhaps one of the more liked people around Japanese wrestling, weirdly. Like it, he, he pops up everywhere because he, he, he he's a friend and he's been a friend of Dragon Gate. Pretty much from the jump, again, go look at Cage Match. That, that's exactly it. Is you know, Look, I have no use for him. You have no use for him. Anybody with taste is sick of him if they at one point enjoyed him. But that's not, that's not the way that he's treated among his peers. I mean, other than Sugi, he's a beloved individual, and he helped out especially the first class of Toriumon guys, you know, kind of Shima through, I don't know, Rio Saito or so. He helped him out tremendously in Mexico. It's it's not an accident that he ended up here. And you might not like it, and I might not like it, and this match did nothing for me, but he's a, he's a guy who's important to the history of this promotion because of what he's done, uh, what he did for these guys when they were far younger. And I, I do think that needs to be mentioned just in case people are unsure of the context of this or if, you know, people raise their eyebrows and, and signal red or throw red flags rather when, no, when Nozawa pops up. But there's a very specific reason this happened. And, I, you know, that's that. Yep. No. And that was nice to see. And then the main event of the night was the Rey de Pareja, Strong Machine Army, JNF versus Doyama. JNF entered the match O oh, with zero points. Doyama entered with two. Time limit draw. So everyone gets a point here. Case, I was not like super into it for like the first 13 minutes of it, but the closing stretch of this was really strong, I thought. That's exactly it. Slow start, got there by the end of it. Was well worth my time. This is not one of those slam dunk go watch this four star matches. 
I, I gave this four stars just because I loved what it represented. You know, this will be when I list out all my four star matches in Dragon Gate at the end of the year, this will be at the bottom of the list. This is like three and a half or three and three quarters plus. But I, I feel the need to represent this on the spreadsheet, which is a nerdy thing, but I, I, I feel the need to also explain that because Yamadoi were brilliant here. Strong Machine F certainly fulfilled his, his end of the bargain. And I thought this was just a phenomenal Strong Machine J performance. This is one of those matches that I've been waiting for him to have. A big spot. I thought I thought it was uh, incredibly interesting that this match was the main event of this show, that neither of the Ray Day Parejas matches were necessarily super strong. But then you throw him in there with Yamadoi, and Strong Machine J fought to their level. He didn't look on their level. It is very clear he's not a top star. But he fought to their level in a way by the end of the match where I said, you know what? I want to see a little bit more Strong Machine J. And that, to me, is a success. The time limit draw was logical. Yamato and Doi couldn't put him away. Strong Machine J wasn't talented enough to put them away. Very logical 20-minute draw. I'm not bothered by the amount of draws, but maybe that's just me. And I, I thought this was super strong. And it was something that it really kind of felt like that as time expired there, that it was like you gave this match five more minutes and it seems like that Jay figures it out. Jay, like maybe they go machine killer and that gets it, but it really felt like that. And the kick out of the Galleria was awesome in this. It just was a really, really fun thing. I guess like my main thing about the time limit draws is you can tell very quickly if you're unspoiled when a match is going to go the distance. That that's my only concern about that. Yeah, it didn't. It didn't strike me when uh, I. I think this was the most obvious of the three. I guess I should say I was not expecting a draw. In what was it, Mojizuki's versus Jason and Jackie? Did that go to a draw? Yes, and then there was the uh, the Corkin one. Yeah, right. Yeah, I did not. Ex- I watched both those unspoiled. I did not expect draws in either of those matches. This one I watched unspoiled. I could kind of pick up on what they were doing, but again, uh, by by the closing stretch. I, I was buying into the near fall. So job well done by all four guys. Yeah, no, for sure about that. And that was the Kyoto show. It'll be up on the network until the 18th. That was not the only Ray de Perejas action we had last week as they went to Okayama, home of Sachi Hoko boy, most popular man of Okayama, super no vacancy, full house for them there. We had two Ray de Perejas matches, KSN. The first one was Kaito Nagano and Yoshiki Kato of the rookie team. Versus Hyo and Ishin. Uh, rookie tag entered at two points. Hyo and Ishin entered at zero. It was Hyo winning with a return to an old favorite, the Bobby Hill special on Kaito Nagano, where he distracted the referee and kicked him right in the in the groin and then did a roll up very quickly, which pulls the all caps team to two points, even with the rookie tag. I would like to see a lot more Hyo and Nagano together. That was my big takeaway here. I, I think those guys are a lot of fun together. I really have enjoyed Ishan on these house shows. I feel like that's like when you really get to see him play in the playpen. Cause I thought, I, I thought it is just something that he is getting a little bit more outwardly charismatic in these. And he's trying out things. And I think that's really cool. You know, he, he's going to be a really interesting guy to watch this year because it's not his time right now. You know, look at Zebras, Shun's champion. Hyo's always doing something. Kai is alongside Shun, and then you've got, you know, Diamante there who's going to steal the show just based on his raw ability. You've also got the looming returns of SP Kento and Fujiwara. They're going to take Preston. Minorita's got a belt. Kakuta's being pushed really hot right, hard right now. He's super hot. Ishin is going to have to work twice as hard to not get lost in the shuffle this year. Now, I am so bullish on him. I, I I think this is a guy who could turn it up and could immediately be seen as a star if they want him to. But I think this is going to be a year of waiting for him. I think it's going to be a little unfortunate. I think he's going to have the talent to move up the card, and they're just not going to have the spots because you're going to have Shun there, and you're going to have Kai there. You're going to have Hyo there. Diamante is very important. And then again, you you know, the young guys, whether it be SB Kento, whether it be Fujiwara, whether it be Kakuta, whether it be even, you know, Daya and Yoshioka, those guys are going to get the call 
before Ishan. I, I think we should pencil in 2024 as his breakout year, but you're exactly right. This is where you get to see him really figuring himself out as a wrestler. And that is really exciting because, you know, I, I think the world of him as a wrestler. I think that if there's a way for Ishan to get a visa, this is the year of December. I think he is the perfect next person to send out to Tori Moncasa. And if he gets a visa, get him to work the States because you're right. He's going to, it's not his turn. He had his big, he had his big second step the big second act as all capsation. And now it's going to be a bit of time until the next thing. And if everyone else is coming back, why not send him out? Yeah, I, that's, that's a very interesting point. I hadn't really thought about him traveling abroad all that much. You know, I, I, I would like to see what he looks like in Mexico, just because I am I'm having a hard I'm having a hard time picturing Ishan on a DTU show. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I, I don't see him really ending up that way. The place that actually I feel bad for him because it's just not going to be the same. Ishan being sent to 2018 Europe would have been great for him. That's <laughs> that's very true. That's really that's I. Th- you almost stumped me with that because I think you're so right that I don't know how to follow up. That's <laughs> like he he would he would be very interesting in America right now. And look from everything that Joe Lanza has reported on the flagship Patreon, and from everything that that I've been told, there's more guys coming to America. And my mind immediately goes to okay, Ishan versus Josh Alexander. Ishan versus Fred Yehi, you know, these, these hard hitters, I I think can get a lot out of Ishan in terms of match quality. And then you have to have the discussion of, well, is Ishan going to America to have great matches or is Ishan going to America to gain a stronger personality? And that, that I don't know. I know I'm interested in great matches and I know I'd really like to see him versus Josh Alexander. Ishan should do blood sport. It's time that they finally have someone of sumo backing in that ring. Come I, on, I was gonna Jeff. say, what's what's his real sport background? I think he's actually a swimmer, but of course, you know, Koji Shinriki. Like he's probably done some form of like elementary sumo just because of his dad. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a quick search here just to see if I can find anything about that. But yeah, that that's exactly it. I mean, him on him on like a blood sport type show would be great. He would fit in there. As really, you know, a, a dumb jock esque wrestler. I mean, him versus Davy Richards is a match that I think would be great. It, it re- weirdly, a- although uh, we know MLW is the land where good matches go to die, I think Ishinihashi would make a lot of sense in the current landscape of MLW. No, no, absolutely. It, it it's something where it just kind of makes sense. I think that this is. Something that if I were him and if I were having the ability to, I'd be looking after dead or alive to send him out. And I think that would just be the best for everyone. And it would make a whole lot of sense there. Uh, the other Ray de Perhaus match was Double Dragons, Daya, and Dragon Kid entering the match at two points versus Asumu and Kanda, M3K, also at two points. We have our first team at four as after what I thought was one of the better matches of the week. Uh, Susumu Okada, the original tag team, got the win with the rare Mugen package. They advanced the four points. I was so close to giving this four stars case. Like, like you could probably talk me into me retroactively making this four stars. Yeah, I ended up at three and a half on this, but I weirdly feel where you're coming from because this match had such a hot closing stretch, specifically between Daya and Susumu, who, as I learned after this, have never had a singles match that. Yeah, I, I was very, it, it was very similar to the Strong Machines versus Yamadoi. Slow start, but by the end of it, boy, was I on board. It was something that I actually really liked the opening stretch because it was the Double Dragons getting the offense and actually kind of slumming it up. And it was kind of fun to see, but then eventually it, it broke down into what I expected. It had a very old school kind of feeling. Maybe that was just me, though. And God, the Mysterios, the Mysterio Rana, and then. Did you see how much air Daya got on the atomic drop for the John Wu? Like, Outstanding. He, insane. Just insane. But yeah, yeah. No, this, this was a lot of fun. This is one of those neither match were as good as 
you know, the young guys versus Shun and Kai or the Mochizukis versus Jason and Jackie. But both of these YouTube matches are worth your time if you're into this tag tournament. Oh, absolutely so. And I mean, that's all that was on the file there, other than, you know, a lot of Sachi and uh, GM Rio Saito. He's always like talking to people after the shows. Like, yeah, it, it, it's kind of charming to see. I think that's really cool. Yeah, no, it's I, look, I love the YouTube uploads. I'm so glad Dragon Gate went in that direction. I'm so glad we're getting all of these tournament matches. And this upcoming week, we've the, the Ray Day Piraeus tournament had this odd slow launch where they gave us you know, three shows one week and then we had to wait a week for two more shows. Business picks up within this next week and we've got a, a pretty interesting double set in Fukuoka this weekend. Yeah, so let's go through this. It's on the 19th, it's on my brother's birthday. That's not, it's on, that, it's on my mother's birthday. She was born a week after me. Oh, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. I mean, yes, that makes sense, right? Yep, nope, nope, for sure. Okay. Yep, yep, we're good there. So the afternoon show on the 19th, it is a 1 p.m. local time start. Case, 10 p.m. for us. 10 p.m. I can. Oh, that's that's good. <sighs> yeah, delightful. Uh, We have Ray DePrejas, B Block, Ben Rita versus Asumu and Kanda. Kagatora versus Eita, non tournament, Fuji, Ginky versus Kai and Hio, uh, Strong Machine J, Jackie Funky, Kamei, and Jason Lee. We actually have a natural vibes trio for once versus Shun, Diamante, and Ishin, Ultimo, Yamato, Kota Minora, BB Hulk versus, eh, versus Dragon Daya, Yuki Yoshioka, uh, Dragon Kid, and Madoka Kakuta. And then the main event for night one, Mochizuki's versus Rookie Tag. It's crazy that that is headlining this show. I am so, I, I was already very excited for that match, but now that that is in the main event slot, I am uh, chomping at the bit to get to it. That is very exciting. Case, I think we might be getting our fourth member of D Courage coming out for the show. And Dragon Kid? Yeah, it just seems like that that's going to be the direction there. And if it's not here, then it's going to be soon after in Corkin. Do you think they'll do Shun versus either Dragon Daya or Dragon Kid for Champion Gate? I don't think you can do Daya yet. I, I, but Kid's safe. Kid's a safe choice. Yeah, they're they're so not to jump ahead, but they're headlining this evening show in Fukuoka. And you you kind of have to do something here, right? Yeah, you, there's not a lot of TV. You got to set up those tight. I I mean, at least with Brave, you could say Ishin, Hio, there's a lot of stuff you could do there. There's been nothing for the Dream Gate. Unless like they better not have like someone pension at uh at last love to book a title match. I think that would suck so much. Yeah, if you if you look ahead, I mean the, the remaining TV this month is is in Kobe, February twenty sixth. And it's Shunen Kai versus the Strong Machines. And for as much as I enjoy Strong Machine J, I, I don't think he's ready for that spot. I, I, I think Shun versus Dragon Kid has to be the front runner right now. Yep. Uh, it makes as much sense as anything else. You know, I just, there's just nothing really going on with the Dream Gate scene. And I think it, it, that it's weird. I mean, there's nothing going on with the, I had to look to see who the Brave Gate champion was just a second ago. And I don't, who uh, the Triangle Gate champions are gold class, yes. Yeah, Minorita's Brave Gate champion. He has a little belt. Come on. That's right. But I, I forgot because it's been so de emphasized this month. So, okay. I mean, you can throw gold class in there against anybody. That doesn't really matter. But yeah. you got to do something with this Dream Gate belt. And I, I'm leaning Dragon Kid here. I just, I just think that makes sense. Yeah. And it's something that I guess it's worth talking about. Are we seeing what happens at Summer Adventure Tag League's pass with the Dream Gate? I know loaded question. Well, Sorry. it's it, it's the, yes, yes and no. It's bad timing in the sense that Shun just won the belt. I think if Yoshioka retains there, we don't have this feeling. But I also think we're seeing why they got away from doing tag leagues for a while. Yeah, I just think about Yamato in 2016 going Summer Adventure Tag League right into Akira Tozawa leaving, and that tanked that title run in my mind. So, Oh, God, did I hate that. 
Yeah, but I think that this afternoon show, there's a lot of fun stuff here. Uh, Kagator versus Eita, that's weird. We'll see. That, 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 that gets my eyebrow up. Uh, but you've got two kind of strong tournament matches here. Uh, Zebrats versus Vibes, that's always fun. and That was great. Yeah. It, 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 I hate to be t- building myself up for a cork and to, or not a cork and a Hakata to let me down, but that's what's happening right here. And then on the evening show, this is a five o'clock local time start. That's a 2 a.m. God's time zone, eight Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, Kota Minor and BB Hulk re enter the fray versus Kung Fu Masters in the Rey de Parejas A block. Yoshiki Kato versus Diamante. Uh, Yamato and Eita versus Kagatora and Kaito Nagano. J and F versus Ben Rita. Ultimo Ginki and Hoho Loon versus the original M2K. Uh, y- uh, Yuki Yoshioka and Madoka Kakuda versus Hyo and Ishin. And then Double Dragons versus Shunkai. Loaded show. I don't remember the last time there was a Fukuoka show. And you have to be a King of Gate show, really. But I, I don't remember a Fukuoka show that looked this good maybe since Hakata closed down. There was the uh, King of Gate final with uh, Benke that was really strong, but that was it. Yeah, I guess that was right after... That That would have been one of the first shows in this building, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, this is really good. I mean, at, there's the M, M2K versus Ultimo Genki Ho-Ho match. I mean, that's not going to be anything special, but that's also not going to be long. But... right. You get Yam- Yamato and Eita versus Kagator and Nagano is fascinating. And Kato versus Diamante is crazy. This is a Mike, this is a great show. It's a strong Cork and level showcase. That's thank you. This this could have been the Cork and Hall show this month. And I think we all would have been pleased with this lineup. Absolutely. And that's going to be on the 19th. I did not pull up the card for the night before that has some King of Gate stuff, Case. Did you? Yeah, some Ray, Ray Day Pareja stuff. Not Ray Day Pareja, but, sorry. Uh, the, well, okay, so that show, the tournament matches that will hit YouTube are going to be Susumu and Kanda versus Shun and Kai. And Kai that, is just, uh, that is just a one-match tournament show. And that will probably be uh, Shun Kai winning to pull Susumu and Kanda back to the field. Yep. Yep. So and then I, there's also, there's going to be a show on the 21st from Kagoshima, and that will have one Kato versus Strong Machine J, which I think is super interesting. But the tournament match there, pay attention to this one. This will be on YouTube. D Courage, Yoshioka, and Kakuta versus Jason Lee and Jackie Funky Kame. <laughs> wow. But that's Kagoshima's getting that. I know. Man, lucky people. It's it's weird the way they laid this tournament out because there's specifically I, I gotta I gotta dig through the schedule here to find it. Oh, it's it's the it's the Kobe show where it's shooting Kai versus the Strong Machines, Yamadoi versus Susumu and Kanda, D Courage versus the Mochizukis, and then Minora and Hulk versus Yon Ishin. I think that's kind of a weak lineup compared to some of the house show matches that are taking place. I mean, uh, you know, they get that match. There's the Yamadoi versus Shun and Kai match in Aichi. Even Nagano and Kato versus Yoshio, uh, Yoshioka and Kakuta, that match is taking place in Aichi too. That, that Kobe lineup is pretty weak compared to everybody else. Yeah, that's, and if I'm right, that's the last show before Corkin for the yes. finals. So yeah, like, so uh, that that's where I assume you know Strong Machine J is gonna gonna get a cheeky victory there and take out Shun and Kai, and then uh, you know after that I don't know. We're halfway through this tournament. And I really have no feel for who's going to advance, which is exciting. I, I like that. You know, this is not a King of Gate tournament where Ben's gonna run away with it or Yoshioka is gonna run away with it. Uh, I I again I I really have no clue who is winning this tournament. Yeah, no, I, at this point, am feeling the exact same way. And that's what makes it exciting. There's, like, no, uh, that there's, like, no, like, indication there. And, and it's something that it's kind of makes, going to make whoever is the uh, 
the winner is like going against big time. It's going to be fascinating. I mean, they're kind of rerunning the Yamato thing again. So that'll be a lot of fun to see. Uh, look, this was a, a boring week of shows just because it was largely unspectacular. But this next week, if if the Fukuoka shows hit the way we think they're going to and those house show matches are fun and there's no reason they shouldn't be, uh, we should be closing February out with a bang. I, I am very into the next two weeks of this company. Yep, it's going to be a whole lot of fun as we start to bring Ray De Pro House to a close and then the... That this weird road road to champion gate becomes somewhat more clear, but case somehow we between everything, I think we've probably gone about an hour and a half when I thought we were going to go 50 minutes. Do you have anything else you want to touch on before we're out of here? Yeah. Good luck piecing all of this podcast together. Mike and I use <laughs> three, Mike and I use three different recording setups to do this show because I had so many issues. So uh, I apologize in advance and we'll be back next week. Yep, we'll be back next week. I don't think it's going to be too bad case, but we'll we'll we'll, we'll see how it is. But uh, hey, it we you know what's the thing that sent us down this thing? Talking about La Estrella's bad bang flavor that he chose. If we, that if, is if I true. Didn't... That is that is when my internet gave up. Was when you talked about La Estrella. Yeah, yep. I I don't know if if the internet's trying to send us a message there about that, but that's going to do it for us on Open the Voice Gate. Thanks for everyone for listening if you enjoyed the show if you're a first timer and if you haven't done this yet please go to itunes or any of your other podcast providers give us a five-star review it's the best way that people find out about the show but you can follow us on twitter at open voice gate cases at underscore in your case i'm at fujihaya thanks for listening to open voice gate we'll be back with you next time take care everyone